Okay, so in, in this session, I will be talking about um, different tools we have in Chipster for uh, doing statistical analyses and also uh, visualizing our data. And uh, I will be covering some statistical concepts, but not really going into much mathematical detail. So we will try and keep things as um, practical as, as possible. So yeah, let's make a start. So when we're um, wanting to do some quality control uh, and visualization, we can use this um, DC2 tool and, and chips to for that. Um, something we need to know is that um, DC2 comes with its own uh, normalization method. And the input file for, uh, for this is this count table transposed.tsv. So we're using the data uh, without any, any transformations or other uh, changes as such. So we're using the data as is. And the data in this case, case will consist of a matrix of uh, non-normalized integer values. And the reason why we are using the data as is, is because DC2, it has this internal, uh, so DC2 has this internal correction for library size based on size factor estimation. And this provides us with an alternative to uh, rarefying to an equal library size. So rarefying is, a, is an approach that was used a lot in the past, but we have found out that there are uh, lots of difficulties associated with that. So this. Uh, internal correction for library size and DC2 uh, provides us with a way around that. And when we are working with DC2, uh, it's important to remember that this is a tool that originates from the RNA seq field. So it wasn't originally developed as a tool for microbiome analysis as such, but it's now. Uh, being increasingly used for microbiome analysis. So uh, in practice, this means that sometimes when we're looking at DSeq2 output, we need to be a little bit cautious about how to interpret the results that we get. Okay, so uh, different ways to visualize our data in Chipster. So let's say that we wanted to look at some differences or similarities between individual samples. So we can use this um, heat map approach for that. So um, in this case, a uh, heat map is, is based on looking at um, differences between individual samples using uh, hierarchical clustering. And the default behavior in Chipster is to use uh, Euclidean distances to uh, measure or to calculate these differences between samples. And that gives us a good idea of how, how similar or different individual samples might be compared to one another. But we might also be interested in visualizing things um, at a slightly broader scale. So we might want to look at differences in group composition instead of individual samples. So uh, Chipster also comes with this um, tool for creating principal component analysis pl plots, uh, so PCA. And <clears throat> we end up with this type of 2D visualization that we have uh, here. And we can see over here that the um, samples are, are color coded by groups. So we have two different groups in here. So this is a very useful tool for finding out if, if groups uh, differ from each other in terms of species composition. And um, we can also use this to get an idea of how much of this difference is explained by, uh, let's say, the group variable. So if we look at, for example, the x-axis on this plot, so this PC1 uh, in the bottom, we can see that along this axis, we have this quite clear split in terms of groups and uh, uh, 
59% of the variance in this case is, is explained by this uh, first axis, so PC1. We can also use this approach to find out if we have some uh, confounding factors, such as batch effects in our, in our data set. So what I mean with this is that uh, we might have some groups of samples, for example, that um, differ from the rest for, for one reason or another. So we could imagine, for example, that these three samples at the bottom, uh, they could be different because of various reasons, but one of the explanations could be a, a batch effect. And continuing from this, we can also use the PCA plots to find out if we have some individual outliers in our, in our data set. So um, often with biological data sets, we will have outliers in the data set. Um, then the challenge is, is interpreting why this might be the case. So it could be because of a purely biological reason, or it could be because of, um, let's say, uh, instrumentation problem. In any case, PCA plots are a good way to find out if we have outliers in the sample and or in the sample set in the first place. So PCA, so this principal component analysis is one example of an ordination method. And if we look at different ordination methods from let's say a wider perspective, then we can split them into two different uh, categories. So we have unconstrained and constrained ordinations. And the PCA is, is an example of an unconstrained ordination method. And what this means in, in practice is that we can use PCA for doing some uh, exploratory data an analysis. So let's say that we have a data set that uh, we want to explore and, and find out different patterns in there. But we, we don't necessarily have much information available in the beginning uh, that would allow us to, to generate some testable hypotheses. So in, the, in this case, we are use, using this ordination to explore the data, but we aren't really testing a particular hypothesis. If we did have a case where we have a clear hypothesis that we want to test, then we could also use uh, these constrained methods, such as the uh, RDA, so redundancy analysis. And what these constrained methods do, they allow us to relate uh, microbiome composition to some particular, some particular variable of interest. And so I have this figure over here that has uh, quite a few different examples of ordinations, and uh, we don't have to take all of those in at the moment. The, the main message is that there are uh, quite a few of them. And if you wanted to look at this in, in more detail in your own time, then I would recommend visiting this, this website that uh, we've listed in, in, in the below. So this page hosted by David Zeleny. And one reason why I recommend visiting this page is also because uh, in addition to some theory, it also gives some very good tips for deciding uh, which of these met methods is the right one to use uh, in your particular case. So sometimes deciding between different ordination methods uh, can be a little bit more involved than what we are able to, to cover in this lecture. But this resource is a good way to uh, go and get some extra information about that. Okay, so in Chipster, we also have this um, tool for doing statistical analyses. So it, it's called the Statistical Analysis for Microgene Studies. And it's, it's split into, into different areas. So the first one is visual analysis. And we can use, uh, for example, these RDA plots to find out if um, some particular variable, such as group variable, explains uh, some of the difference between the samples. And although 
uh, rarefaction curves are uh, maybe less widely used these days, we can still generate rarefaction curves to find out um, whether we sampled all of our groups equally well. So rarefaction curves are still very useful for, for this purpose. We can also generate some rank abundance curves to find out if um, there are differences in groups in terms of the overall uh, species richness and also the relative abundance of different species. So these are more uh, visual tools, but then we also have some statistical tools in, in Chipster. So we can use these to find out if the groups uh, differ in terms of their uh, taxon composition. And for this, we can use a test called PERMANOVA, so permutational uh, multivariate analysis of variance. There are some other ones in, in Chipster also, but we will talk mostly about PERMANOVA today. And also, um, we can run an indicator species analysis to find out if we have some species in the data set, some, some particular species that differentiate the groups best. And we can, we can also generate some, some diversity estimates. So looking at how different species uh, contribute to the overall diversity in our samples. And so for this uh, statistical analysis tool, there are two input files. So we have this count table.tsv, and then we have this uh, phenoldata.tsv. So these are the in input files for the uh, statistical analysis tool in Chipster. And yeah, so if you want to look at uh, some, some information for statistical analyses and microbial ecology, um, this website is a very good resource. So uh, it's called the Guide to Statistical Analysis in Microbial Ecology, uh, Gustame in short. And the address is, is listed here below. So uh, this website gives inf information on a lot of different uh, statistical tests that are commonly used in the field of microbial ecology, including ones that we uh, won't discuss today. Okay, so let's look at redundancy analysis in some detail. So. Yeah, we can use this to find out if, uh, for example, the group variable explains at least some of the difference between our different sample groups or our samples. And this is a constrained ordination approach. In this case, we are using the group as the explanatory variable. And uh, often, often with microbiome data, we are dealing with some quite um, let's say messy measurements or uh, messy matrices. So we have uh, a lot of zeros in, in our community data. This is typical of ecological data sets. And to, to deal with these types of problems, we can use this Hellinger transformation. So this is a transformation that downweighs uh, variables that have low counts and also ones that have a lot of zeros. And we get also from this RDA, this 2D plot and uh, some information for, for reading the plot. So um, again, we have color coded our, our samples by group. Uh, so these are the different colors here in, in, the, in the plot, red and blue. Each uh, sample is, is one of these dots, but then we also have these uh, smaller gray dots in the, in the figure, and these correspond to different species. Um, something to know is also that we have this um, arrow pointing to the left in this case, so um, the group's value increases in the direction of this arrow. So uh, in the case of this plot, we have group one on the right and then group two on the left. And in some quite small uh, font size, we have the p-value also over here uh, in the top right corner of the plot. Uh, that gives us an idea of the uh, group effect and its uh, 
statistical significance. So this is uh, telling us that we have uh, quite a low p-value for, for this group effect. Um, another thing the RDA tells us is um, the percentage of variance explained by the group. So um, we can see this um, split on the x-axis once again. And in this case, the RDA uh, suggests that we have around 12% uh, difference in there. Uh, sorry, 11.19%. Yeah. So the percentage of variance explained by the group in this case is on the x-axis, and that's 11.19%. Uh, So in Chepster, we can we can generate rarefaction curves, and we can use these to check uh, the sampling efficiency, uh, both within and, and, and between sample groups. And what this does, it it plots the number of, of taxa, so dif different numbers of file types. We can see these on the y-axis, and then we have the sampling effort on the x-axis. And in this plot. Uh, lines uh, correspond to the different sample groups and then uh, this kind of hazy cloud around the line is the 95% confidence interval. And so if the confidence intervals overlap between the different groups, uh, we can quite easily conclude that we have similar sampling efficiency uh, for the different groups. And so yes, this, this approach was commonly used in the past for library size normalization. Um, and this was done before doing any statistical analyses, but uh, there's some increasing evidence of, of drawbacks associated with this. One of the main problems is that we often lose uh, quite a lot of data. And this can in introduce a type of bias of its own. So in, in Chipster, we can uh, generate these rank abundance curves to look at um, differences in groups in terms of their species richness and also the relative abundance of different species. And in these plots, the y-axis is the relative abundance. And what this means is um, how many sequences we have uh, for each species. And uh, those species that have the most sequences, we can find those on the top left in these plots. And so on the x-axis then we have the abundance rank, and this is based on the overall number of sequences for each species. And this gives, gives us an idea of the uh, species evenness in our samples. So this is um, visually estimated by the shape of this curve. So in, in the case of these images that we have over here, we can see that uh, we have some differences in, in relative abundance. So we have some taxa in there that are quite a lot more abundant than others. If we had a, if we had a completely flat line in these plots, it would mean that all of the species are equally abundant. And so yes, in Chipster, we can um, look at diversity as well. So uh, some background surrounding this. So we can uh, look at diversity from, let's say, three different angles. So we have alpha, beta, and gamma diversity. Uh, alpha diversity corresponds to diversity within a sample, whereas beta diversity corresponds to diversity between samples. So we're looking at between sample uh, relatedness in this case. Uh, and finally, then gamma diversity, uh, this stands for total diversity. So we're looking at the total diversity and all, all the samples that we have. And so this gives us a way to think about how each sample uh, contributes to the overall diversity in our data set. So a sample that has uh, lots of unique samples, that sample would then have a higher contribution to the uh, gamma diversity than, than those samples that have more equal diversity. 
and we can measure diversity in, in various ways. So uh, one way is to, to calculate some diversity indices such as Shannon's diversity or um, a simple approach is to, is to count the number of species, so numbers of species or observed numbers of species. And of course the, the species count is, is always dependent on our, our sampling depth. Uh, so uh, this is one, one case where the rarefaction curves can be useful also, so they will give us more of an idea about the sampling depth that we have managed to achieve when running our analyses. And another thing we can do is, is run this indicator species analysis. And uh, this is a tool to find out if we have some particular taxa in our samples that are able to differentiate the groups. So uh, answering the question of which taxa are able to differentiate the sample groups uh, the best. So Chipster comes with two analysis tools for this. Uh, so one is this Dufresne uh, Legendre indicator species analysis tool. And this is based on estimating an indicator value uh, using fidelity and relative abundance of individual species. And something that we get from this is a p-value that uh, we can use to find out uh, which species are then able to differentiate the groups. So we get p-values for taxa that uh, separate the uh, groups of interest. We also have this other approach. So this is called the indicator species analysis, um, minimizing intermediate occurrences. And Okay, what we mean by minimizing intermediate occurrences? Um, with this tool, we are calculating the extent to which uh, different taxa are uh, always present or, or always absent in our clusters or, or different sample types. So these two different tools can, uh, in this sense, support one another also. Okay, so we come now to uh, the topic of, of overall species composition in our sample. So we want to have uh, some idea using statistical testing whether our groups differ in terms of their overall taxon composition. And uh, Chipster comes with three different uh, tools for this uh, based on slightly different tests and methods. So. Uh, the one that I will be spending most of my time talking about is this PERMANOVA or uh, permutational multivariate analysis of variance. And for this, we use distance matrices. We will soon find out uh, how this looks like in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of practice. We also have this uh, PERM-DISP test. So uh, this is a test for looking at uh, multivariate homogeneity of group dispersions. Um, and then Chipster also comes with this AMOVA tool or analysis of molecular variance. And yes, so PERMANOVA and PERMDISP, these two tests are often used hand in hand, and we will cover both of those today. So uh, starting with PERMANOVA, so this is a, a method that allows us to compare different sample types. For example, let's say communities that come from different types of environments. And there are lots of different benefits to using PERMANOVA. So we can use any distance measure that we want uh, with this method. And um, because we're dealing with microbiome data, we also need to have a method that is tolerant of uh, zero values and also uh, non-independence. So um, quite typical in environmental and ecological data sets is that we will have lots of different variables that are also um, associated with one another. So we have some degree of non-independence in there. And I would say that this is almost impossible to avoid. So PERMANOVA gives us a, a tool that is tolerant of these um, non-independent values and also zero values in our data sets. And <clears throat> the idea 
Well, it, it's all it's all based on on constructing a similarity or dissimilarity matrix that we have here, as an example in the uh, bottom left, and the output of the Permanova test. Uh, it's made up of, of three different things. So the first thing is um, we get this pseudo F value, uh, and this is the test statistic of the Permanova test. And if we get a high pseudo F value, it means that we have more uh, group separation happening. And this uh, pseudo F value is, is calculated by comparing uh, within group variation versus between group variation. And we will soon look at this in a little bit more detail. We also get these uh, degrees of freedom, and this is a number that's based on uh, the overall sample size, so how many samples we have in our, in our data set. And then we get also this uh, p-value, which tells us about the uh, statistical significance of this pseudo f value that we calculate. So overall, uh, Permanova is based on comparing centroids. And uh, we're dealing with, with uh, within group variation and also between group variation. So we can look at um, group centroids, which in this figure are shaped symbol. And this is determined using distances from individual replicates to, to the uh, group centroid. And then we have this star-shaped symbol in the middle of the plot over here. And yeah, this is the overall centroid of the data set. And this is then determined using distances from the group centroids. Um, so distances from group centroids to the overall centroid are used to find out this between group variation. And okay, this is a called uh, permutational, it's called a permutational test. So what's the role of permutation? Um, in this case, it's the basis for estimating the p-value. And uh, this it's the same principle as in other permutation tests also. So what this means is that we are uh, taking our original data set with the different sample groupings, we break this up and we reshuffle the data uh, randomly as many times as we want to, so we can define the number of times the data are reshuffled. And then uh, for each of those reshuffled data sets, we calculate the pseudo F value again. So we end up with a lot of uh, pseudo F values doing this, which then gives us uh, an entire distribution of pseudo F values, one for each permutation. And these values end up being more or less normally distributed as we have in this figure on the left. Um, we can then look at the pseudo F value of our actual original uh, data set and then um, use that distribution to find out whether that value lies at the fringes of that distribution or if it's more in the middle. So if it's more at the fringes, then we can uh, more easily conclude that something interesting is going on in terms of, um, let's say, biological significance. So uh, in this case, we can go ahead and reject our, our null hypothesis. Uh, so why, why are we doing this? It's because uh, this approach doesn't require our original data sets to be distributed in a certain way and okay there are lots of uh, statistical tests that do make these types of assumptions about how our data are distributed but uh, with microbiome data and other uh, complex data sets like this uh, adhering to these assumptions about distributions can be very difficult or often impossible so um, Using a permutational in this in this case allows us to use um, use these complex data and make sense of them uh, without having to have the data distributed in some particular way. And okay, so we get let's say that we have an instance where we get a significant result from our Permanova test. Mm -hmm. There. 
can be a couple of reasons why this happens. So actually a few reasons why this happens. So uh, these can be due to location effects and dispersion effects or a combination of both. And uh, let's look at what this means in practice. So I have this figure here uh, on the left. Uh, so let's look at the top left first. So this case of having no effect at all. So we have two different sample groups in here. And we can see that um, the two different sample groups don't really differ from one another in terms of where they are located in this uh, uh, space in the plot. And we can also see that the uh, degree of variation within sample sets, it looks very similar to it. Well, it looks similar in both data sets. So in this case, we have no effect. Mm. If we had a location effect, so this is this case that we have here on the um, top right. Um, so in this case, we can see this quite clear split between the two groups along axis one. Um, but we can also see that the uh, individual samples in here are uh, quite equally spread. So we don't really see much of a difference in, um, in terms of how much variation there is within uh, the di different data sets. So this is a location effect, but we can also have a dispersion effect. So this is this case that we have here on the bottom left. So we don't see this uh, location effect here as much. So the individual points are overlapping quite a lot, but we can see in, that in, um, in one of these data sets or sample groups, the um, individual points are clustered much more tightly together. So, this is what we would call a dispersion effect. And yeah, we can also have combinations of both situations. So we have a situation here on the bottom right where we have both the location and the dispersion effect. So when we're running Permanova and we get a significant p-value from there, um, that p-value can be because of a location effect, a dispersion effect, or both. And this is why we often use this perm desp test in uh, combination with Permanova. So this can be used uh, to look at differences in dispersion um, in between different samples. And uh, there's also a more, more recent version of Permanova that uh, accounts for this issue. But uh, in Chipster, we are using these tools uh, separately or let's say alongside one another. So if you think about the output that we get from a Permanova test, uh, what we get first is the model call. So the type of model that we have specified. And then after that, we get our uh, statistical test results. And there are a few things in this output that are useful to look at. So this PRF uh, gives, gives us an O idea of the overall uh, significance of the model. So in this case, we have a value of uh, 0 0.0024, uh, which means that it's, it's uh, statistically significant. So the cutoff for this is 0 0.05. And then we also get this R, R2 or R squared value that tells us how much variation in these distances is explained by um, the variable in question. So in this case, the group variable. So we can also see the variables here in this uh, test output. And this uh, R squared value tells us that in this case, the group variable is explaining around 33% mm, of the variation in distances. And we can also look at the perm disp output. So the output here is, is quite similar. And the test is based on ANOVA using group dispersions. So we get uh, an F value. And this F value is the, it's, it's the test statistic. And it gives us an idea about the overall effect size. And in this instance, we see that the p-value is uh, 0 0.13. Um, 
So this is quite a lot over 0 0.05. So we can conclude that there's no um, significant dispersion effect. So if we think about this in the context of the significant permanova result that we got, then um, we can conclude that it, this is likely to be a location effect since we don't see a significant dispersion effect. And uh, that is the last slide of this session. So I hope that these, um, or that this lesson covers some, has covered some useful concepts for you and gives you a better idea of um, the tools that we have available in Chipster. And um, also I hope that the links that we provided give you some further resources that you can explore in your own time to find out more about uh, data analysis and microbial ecology.